Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Relevant. This is Do All The Things on today's episode. Tape servers back once again for a quick retooling and a follow-up. How I plan on implementing it going forward. Stay tuned. So if you've been following the comedy, you might be privy to the series I've done on this tape server build. Now, of course, I'm no expert. This is my first tape server. You were basically following the process of me getting the thing and trying to figure out how it's working. And now it is working really well and really smooth. So I threw it together with scrap parts and then I upgraded it. And then the drive failed. And then I changed out the drive for an even cheaper drive, but got lucky. And then in the last episode, my interface card failed for whatever reason, it went corrupt. So I took the interface card that came with this drive, which wasn't working, repaired it by replacing the capacitors on it, and now I'm gonna tell you, this thing runs smooth as butter. As such, I've decided to invest in it further. I have ordered another pack of something like 30 tapes. And even though I haven't dented the last batch of 30 tapes I ordered, well, I'm planning to, because I'm gonna be putting more stuff on this moving forward. Before, it took like four hours to burn an 800 gigabyte tape. Now now it only takes two because, I don't know, I think that interface card I have in there just works better with the drive itself. It came with the drive. I'm guessing it was spec'd out to run with a drive. It doesn't take forever to boot up like the old interface card. It doesn't have a boot ROM on it. I don't think it was designed to be doing that. And then of course, uh, with some recommendations from commenters on the previous episodes, I've cranked up my stripe size. If you're not necessarily familiar with what that means, it's basically the size of a chunk of data it's gonna write to the tape. This applies to hard drives too. And it kind of dictates the minimum file size you can write to the tape. For example, if you uh, format your hard drive or burn your tape to say a 64 kilobyte stripe size and only have a 32 kilobyte file, it said that it won't put any other files on that stripe. That 32K file is going to take up that entire 64K chunk of space. So there's a bit of a trade-off between smaller stripes and bigger stripes. The smaller stripes are more space efficient where smaller files are gonna burn up and waste less space. But the larger stripes, you can write to them faster and I guess read to them faster too. So I remember back in the day, stripe size was something you had to give consideration to when you were setting up RAID arrays on your boot drive. An operating system would have a lot of small little files it would scatter about. So you kind of had to scratch your head and figure out what stripe size you wanted to use. In this case, I don't think there's really any files that are smaller than the minimum stripe size. If there are, there's very, very few of them. Most of the files I'm burning to tape because I'm backing up video, well, they're in the hundreds of megabytes to tens of gigabytes. So yeah, we cranked that stripe size. It, it increased the speed by at least 25%. Now the four hours that I quoted before, that was about 750 gigs on the broken drive with the old controller. Once I got the newer drive, it went faster. And then once I tried that new controller, I think it got faster still. And then, oh yeah, at least 20, 25% speed gains. That's off the top of my head. I didn't actually measure it or anything, of course. So what am I doing with this thing moving forward? Well, I guess I'll cut a little bit to the TLDR. I gotta be installing one of these bad boys. That is a two and a half inch hot swap bay for SSDs and well, laptop sized hard drives. Now in my original build of this, I had a three and a half inch hot swap bay so that I could take whatever project drive I wanted to back up, slop it right in there and then back it up to tape. However, this bigger drive, this chunk unit right here took up all that space. I can't do that anymore. So I ended up direct connecting this to my main computer. My main computer had a spare ethernet port and I just made a, a crossover cable. And so this thing has an internal one terabyte hard drive for caching in space. It's not the boot drive. It has a 128 meg, if I recall correctly, Samsung SSD for booting. So as it stands right now, I only use my tape drive to back up my finished YouTube projects. Once I've posted that, I take the project folder, transfer it over to here. Once I have 800 gigs or just under 800 gigs accumulated, I burn it to tape. Now seeing as how I don't crank out videos that fast, like one a week, it's taken a long time to fill all these tapes. However, what you don't know is that I could film two or three videos a week. That's an exponential storage problem. 
I am accumulating more projects ready to edit than I'm cranking out. And that's both good and bad. It's good because, well, that means I have a lot of content. I, I haven't got writer's block here. It's just going to keep coming. It might not necessarily be about computers. It might not necessarily be about guitars, but the content's just going to keep coming. If I stop filming right now, I could be posting still one a week for like at least a year. What that bad is, it means I have a problem storing it. I need to store all these raw projects ready to edit. So this is how I'm doing it so far. Seen here, as an example, our two Western Digital four terabyte drives. This is my third set of four terabyte pairs. They're labeled A and B. So when I finish shooting a project, I ingest it to the A drive. And then once I got it all sorted out, I use a program, Always Sync, I believe it's called, to basically synchronize what's on drive A to drive B, making an exact copy of drive A to drive B. And one might ask, why don't you just do RAID 1? Well, because these don't live in the computer. And for two, I don't want automatic backup. It has happened in the past where I messed something up on drive A and then I'm like, oh boy, oh geez, okay, hold on here. And then I go over to drive B and pull that data off. If I do automatic synchronization on the fly, then whatever I screw up in drive A is going to be automatically screwed up in drive B and that defeats half of the purpose of why I do these backups. So every time I need storage, I don't just buy one drive, I buy two. I buy a four terabyte drive and then I buy another four terabyte drive and I have a lot of drives stacking up and four terabytes is like <laughs> the biggest drives I can afford at once, especially when I have to buy two of them. And they're not even new drives, they're used drives. I'm buying these puppers off eBay. So what's my plan moving forward? Well, I've invested in some more two and a half drives. I have a stack of these, but none of them are big enough to do this job properly. So I recently purchased a pair of one terabyte blue drives that I've actually formatted or partitioned, I should say, with a just under 800 gigabyte partition. So there's a bit of unused space on these drives. The idea is when I fill one of these puppers up, it's ready to get burned to tape. So what do I do? I ingest to drive A and instead of transferring synchronizing to drive B, I transfer synchronize to one of these guys instead. Then once I filled this guy, I make a folder in here reflecting that batch. And then I take this guy, I put it into here, then I fire up tape server and I back it up. So what I'm gonna be starting to do is I'm gonna be backing up all my incoming projects to tape instead of a second hard drive. And then boom, I freed up this drive for my next batch. And I have three sets of these now. So by instantly taking this route, I've gained 12 terabytes. And because I got these tapes for cheap, it's costing me less per terabyte to make my backups. And to top it all off, tapes are relatively in valuable compared to hard drives. I could have one hard drive fail and then find out the other ones failed too or something to that effect, even though that's unlikely. These are mechanical devices and if one fails, good luck getting your data off of it unless you seek out professional help expensive professional help. A tape, it sits on a shelf and nothing happens to it. Keep it warm, keep it dry, keep it away from electromagnetic radiation, and it's good for 30 years. And as long as I can get myself, my hands, on a tape drive that can read it, I'll be able to recover my data. At some point, when I'm done processing the data that's stored on this and made finished projects, well, I'll just rewrite over that tape and I'll cycle this process, I guess, until the tape wears out. Furthermore, I didn't just get one of these two one terabytes, I got two of them because there's the other storage problem that's even worse. And that's my raw footage from my Atomos recorder. That popper right there that we're seeing upside down here, I'm gonna flip it for you, whoop. Yeah, that's the Atomos recorder. I may not have complained about my Z50, but my Z50, it looks amazing, but its ability to actually capture the images is garbo. It has the 30 minute timer and gives you no warning when that timer is up. So before I got my Atomos, I lost all sorts of footage and had to get creative in editing. The Atomos solves that problem. I press record and it just keeps going. And the Nikon, well, one thing it is happy to do is just keep feeding HDMI signal to the Atomos. As long as it has battery power, I'm good. And well, I can see the thing. So it's confirming right now, it's recording. And this is the footage it's recording. 
The problem is it records in Apple ProRes, which is almost 100 megabits a second. How does that work out again? 100 megabits divided by eight, 12.5 megabytes a second. The fact of the matter is that thing makes big files. Now to save space, what I've been doing when I ingest, I don't ingest directly. I'll use a program called Catalyst Browse. It's Sony software that I was made aware of when I got my ZV-1 and I'll convert the ProRes to SAVC 50 megabit, cutting my data rate in half. And it also matches the file format that the ZV-1's cranking out. The ZV-1 is actually only an SAVC 16. And so far it, it looks good enough. And you might ask, why do I want to kill the quality of my videos? Well, because YouTube does it for me anyway, so why blow all this data rate just to have YouTube crunch and compress it? I might as well crunch and compress it myself and give YouTube a ready to go file, right? But at the end of the day, part of that data rate has to do with the color space. If you have a camera capable of capturing 10-bit color, it uses more data. The Atomos is recording in 10-bit color right now, but my Z50 is only 8-bit color. So there is wasted information there. I found in practice that when I convert for ProRes to SAVC 50, it's almost completely lossless. Like in editing, I can't tell the difference. However, I still keep the ProRes footage. I only have one copy of it. I don't back it up. So if I lose that copy, it's gone. I have converted it to SAVC already, my working copy. I've made a backup of it. So if I lose my raw footage, I can still do the project. That's fine. But there has been the odd time, it's maybe happened twice in the year that I've been doing this, where for some reason I was missing footage. It happens. Sometimes when you're doing a shoot, you start and stop this pepper like 10 times. You have 10 files and when you're ingesting, you're not paying attention, you only encoded nine. And then when you go to edit it, there's a hole and you're like, oh geez, where's that footage? And then of course I can go back, dig out the raw data. Oh, there it is. Do the re-encoding again. There it is. That happened at least once. Another time, I actually had a corrupt file for some reason. It just wouldn't import into my editor. So I went back and re-encoded it and then I was good. And that's where the second drive comes in because I'm also gonna be storing my raw footage on tape too because it's cheaper and yeah. I'm burning up hard drive storing that raw animals footage faster than I'm burning storing my incoming footage. I bought three three terabytes maybe a couple months ago and they're full now almost already. So I, you know, tape drive, tape drive, tape drive, tape drive. I'm gonna be finding out just how resilient this guy is, just how many tapes I can burn. And I guess eventually in a long enough time span, just how resilient the tapes are. Because for the raw footage and the incoming footage, I'm gonna be recycling, reusing those tapes. So now that I've been talking for a whole bunch of time. The entire purpose of this video is to basically just follow up with people who've been following the series. My tape drive adventure series is a bit more popular. It appears that very few people on YouTube are casually using tape drives. So if you followed this series, that's all this video is a follow up. And now we just do a quick retool. Oh, I still haven't removed this thing from the last time I worked on this. Um, yeah, let's get this out of here. That was a creative way to hold a cable. Ah, what the heck is this connector? And is it seriously only, like I kind of want to find one of these connectors with, with more breakouts so that I can hook up more drives. That would be ultimate because that's one limiting factor. This board only has three SATA ports and I'm using two already. One for the SSD, one for the internal drive. I just kind of schlepped this thing in there, didn't I? Well, let's, uh, let's use our little holder to tack that down. All right, so uh, well, how do we do this? I gotta take this uh, oh thing off the front. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's that plan's not working. Gotta remember how to take this case apart, bud. Okay. And I have some cables tied in here that you can barely see. Oh, I gotta undo my cable management. Uh. One thing I'm also considering doing is investing in a much larger internal caching drive in this thing. Just haven't pulled the trigger on that one yet. Half because of the SAS interface. I would want to get a SAS drive. But some of the documentation for tape drives says don't use the same interface for the tape drive as you use for the hard drive it's running off of. I think that's BS. I don't understand why a nice PCI Express interface card with all the bandwidth it has can't handle two freaking SATA devices. Like, SATA nowadays is the lowest lowest common denominator in data transfer. Frickin' USB is faster in SATA now, bud. I'm gonna have just enough resources to add just one more SATA device to this. So that's gonna be good. Even though this is a two, a dual rack, I'm only gonna be using one of them for now anyway. 
One of these days, I like to upgrade this to something a little bit more modern, maybe something a little bit more AMD APU-ish. What is this? Hey. Cool. Well, that slots right in there. I'm just gonna pick up some screws here. I got three, I got four. All these screws are different. That wouldn't have flied with me years ago. I would have been like, oh, I gotta match all the screws. Yeah, let's get them in there. Boop. The most anticlimactic computer build video on the YouTubes to date. Okay, so we have one more SATA power connector. We're gonna go right onto the drive with that. Now these little adapter bays have power adapters and they're mostly just to make the light chooch. That's all they do. But we're going to be bypassing that and basically connecting SATA power directly to it. Then figuring out how to strap these cables back down, bud. There's a couple little holes right in here. Oh, tricky, tricky. You know what, we're gonna use the top bay. There's a nice chunk of airspace up there. All right, we got our rear arse cables strapped back down. How's that look from the front now? Eh, passable. So <clears throat> now I have to get, oh, look at the short little cables. I forgot how tight I made this package. I gotta get another SATA connector from there to there. I gotta go find more SATA cables, huh? Oh, I found another shouty. It's not gonna reach. No, no way that's gonna reach, bud. It looks like it would reach there. Would this reach here? No, that's not gonna reach. None of it reaches there. Oh, okay. Let's go back to the uh, hardware department. The quest just is to find a not so inordinately long cable. Is that even a word? I think it is, I just said it wrong. This one's cute. Oh, freak, that guy's not happy. Not happy at all. No, sir, I do not believe I have any more short and SATA cables left, sir. Oh, this is going to have to do. It's it's a bit of a cutie. It's not the longest one in the world. It's not the shortest one either, sir. Let's just stick it if it been in the hole there and see what it does. What nation are you from? What? Oh, I'm remembering my sketchy CPU mounting solution. I meant to change that. Okay, this is a bit of a tight fit. It is freaking hiding under there, bud. Ah, we got a two-hander. One finger from each hand. That's fun. Ugh, but not super effective. Come on, get in there. Okay, snap. That's right, you have tuned in to watch me connect SATA cable. <laughs> let's, let's just leave it like this. S for SATA. <laughs> Actually, it kind of wants to be like that, I think. I think it's happy like that. Yeah, that's fine. You know what? Just like that. We'll, we'll pop it up there. That'll kind of hold it into place. Maybe even uh, a little bit more over like that. There, there we go. Oh, it's going uh, very close to all these power rails. I wonder if that will interfere. Yeah, I'm getting paranoid now. Let's uh, let's see about uh, putting it somewhere else. Oh, we got a loop-de-loo in here now. Okay, you know what? That'll do. That'll do. Can you see it? No, it probably blends in with all the black in here. <laughs> Take my word for it, says. Give me faith that I have put this in there correctly. Okay, now one of the last things I want to do while I'm in here is because I want to see if I can better implement this SAS strategy. I want to find out what kind of connector this is. And I'm gonna, you know, get record of what this card is too. Cause you know, I, I never really bothered with this card before. It didn't work originally. All right, so what do we got here? LSI, huh. Dell labeled. It's a situation where I'm probably lucky this thing's old so that the drivers were built into Windows 10. Those are the capacitors that I replaced. They were the same profile as the bracket here before, but now they stick out more. Good thing there's nothing next to them. Cool, look at the cute little 75 megahertz timing chip. Okay, let's punch into the old Googler and see what it has to say. We have LSA SAS 1068 digichip.com. Oh, I found the data sheet for this specific chip that's on here. Apparently it's eight port capable. Oh boy, there's a lot of pins on this pupper. That's a big nope for me at my uh, pay grade. Oh, <laughs> I missed it. You blink, you miss it. Model UCS51. Okay, there it is on Amazon, a 5i SAS controller. Um, thanks for giving me specifications. Oh, I think I found a manual SAS internal connector. Okay, I need to know what kind of connector that is. Four internal. Okay, so yeah, it's a four port. Okay, that, that confirms that. We're definitely being able to do more than one drive with this guy because, you know, I want to be able to put more drives in here. You can get SAS drives for dirt cheap. I can replace that one T with like a three T, be able to cash up multiple backups. And uh, yeah, you can get like a three, four terabyte SAS drive for like 50 bucks because nobody wants them. You need a special control to run them. This is Yolo Bomb four port SAS internal internal cable. Oh, dad, new. WTF is all this stuff. Key term SAS, bud. 
Oh, it actually made it more sassy. <laughs> See, we get mostly these kinds of cables here. Like that's a recognizable connector and there's a different kind there. Oh, we found another cable with similar connectors. Can you tell us what those connectors are called, bud? No, no, you can't. Thank you. We're having to do all the research here. All the research in the world. Oh, look, it's one of the first things that comes up. Oh yeah, w what do we got here? It looks like this one. Yeah, yeah, it definitely looks like this one, sir. SFF8484. SFF8484. $84 from China. Oh no. Oh wait, here's 20 from Hong Kong. Oh, $60 are coming down there, but I'm talking funny. Is there one locally? Uh, no. Oh, this one looks nice here. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Just the connector. Adapter to connector. No power adapter. So yeah, it does look like we can indeed get one of these cables. It's SFF8484, except it's gonna be coming from Slowboat. All right, well, that confirms that. So now I know what direction I wanna go in in the future of this thing, because hey, it looks like this isn't gonna be the last time you're seeing it. I thought the last time you were gonna be seeing it was the third video, but no. Cause yeah, like right here in Canada for a uh, not whole heck of a lot of money. Oh, boom, 45 bucks for three terabytes. Oh, I wish I could buy three terabytes for that money all day long. And you can if it's SAS. Oh, it has the special connector. Yeah, right, so does this. So I need SFF8484 to whatever the frick that is. Pretty sure I saw that in there. Okay, okay, okay. But yeah, these guys, uh, okay, it's a 7.2, so it's not a huge ripper. It might be worth chucking in here just to have a bigger cache drive. Then when I remove that cache drive, that's gonna free up another SATA port so I can put more two and a halfs in the front. And then yeah, that is, I guess, what we're gonna be doing with this thing. So let's get it all put together and test on it. And here we are booted into the Windows environment, debatably. One of the most polluted environments. And uh, well, now the hope is that we just go ahead and uh, pop and fresh one of these guys in there. It should work. I'm not sure which one of these drives I put the data on. So we're gonna see. But oh, hey, perfect. This is the drive. And I mounted this one too. Tape it back up, which doesn't have anything really. <laughs> Those last two finished projects. All right, we're gonna go ahead and mount a tape in here, affectionately labeled 1689 of the TF series. You get in there, bud. That's gonna be the first of N1. Uh, we need a new project. Name. Well, it's gonna be incoming one, INC one, and the tape number TF1689. Click here to add files and folders you wanna back up, sir. Oh, it scrolls dummily. Incoming tape, get rid of that. I don't want the base folder. So we will go through and we will do one of these. Okay. Okay, click here to add tape back up. And here we go. Well, let's crank that. Oh, 256? Well, it's not that big. So you can see the reason why we can get away with cranking the stripe size. It's not like it's a, not, I was hoping maybe one or two meg stripe size, but 256 it is. Is this something I should be using? Calculate and store CRC checksum. Data compression, no thank you. No point, it's hard to compress. This is less than 800 gigs anyway. No encryption, no incremental. Okay, I don't think I usually click that, so I'm not going to. In case of error, continue backup anyway. I unclick that. If there's an error, I want to know, bud. All right, apply. Operation successful TF1689 run. Wait, <laughs> yes. Now we wait and see just how long it's gonna take now. We're gonna notice right away, it starts smooth and strong. No choking. Listen to her just rip, bud. Oh, was that a little choky or? Oh, she's a little bit more choky now. This is what I'm used to here. Wait, it seems to want to go faster. What's the data look like here? 4.1 gigabyte, 4.2. Maybe if I stay away from the desk and I don't bump it. 
4.3. It let, it's like it keeps shifting up in gears. And it's predicting two hours, just over two hours. All right, well, we're gonna leave it alone. Oh, it makes lots of noises. But hey, we'll see what happens when it's done. 95%. It looks like we're back just in the nick of time, even a little bit early. I feel like I have noticed a little bit of the old back and forth there. Maybe some tapes are better than others. These are used tapes after all, but as long as it writes the data reliably. When she gets ripping, she gets ripping though, bud. And she feels like she's running cool. Cooler than the last system. Come on, bud. Come on. I'm at the edge of my seat. It's a lot more back and forth than I remembered. How come every time I start shooting video about this guy saying, hey, look how nice it runs. That's when it acts up. Still working way better than that first drive. How's the data flowing, by the way? Oh, oh, oh. Disc says it peaks to 97%. Now it's hard to tell because I don't exactly know if this time scale equates to what's really happening with the drive. You hear the drive glitch out and you see these peaks. There's a possibility that these dips happen when the drive shifts gears and it's not uh, pulling information. Right now we got a long run and it's pulling consistent amount of data. Okay, we had a dip. It's like doing a sports commentary here. Oh, and the drive is spinning and it's spinning so hard and it's trying to get that data to the tape. But oh, there was a dip. There was a dip. We heard a recall. We heard it pull back and then start up again. What is it doing when it does that? I don't know. Nobody knows. Maybe tape drive experts out there know, but this commentator does not know. Now it's not showing maxed out transfer rates. So this chart here is just its active time. This actually shows the transfer rates and the transfer rates are not necessarily maxed out. I don't know, 60, 70 megabytes a second might be maxed out for that drive. Hmm, maybe I need faster drives. Maybe these drives weren't the best investment. I know it goes pretty slick chickens off the internal drive. Maybe I should do a future experiment where I cache whatever I put onto these drives onto the internal drive and then burn from there and see what happens. This sounds like a good run. Yeah, come on, one last run to home plate. That's one big long file right there, eh? Look at that. That sounded like the tape changed directions. <laughs> and here we go. Five, four, three, two, one, and... Oh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're <laughs> you figured it said 100% it was done, right? Apparently not. Oh, there it goes. And the tape rewind. All right, what's the survey say? Log. Back up, completed, successfully. Average speed, 4.6 gigabytes a minute. 785.55 gigabytes written. Now here is one of the first tells about this particular drive. If you recall the old drive, we were lucky if we got 750 out of it. And in fact, it could glitch out less than that. So I had to work very conservatively and I had the end of my data sets get cut off where I'd have to take the last project or the last bit of data on that set and put it at the beginning of the next set. But that's not happening here. We're getting consistent consistently within the uh, realms that we're expecting. So I guess we could get up to 800 gigabytes out of a tape, even though that's hard because it means I have to find an oddball project kind of slots in there. It's just, well, it's more trouble than it's worth. So a little bit of overhead's getting written off there. 785 gigabytes written to a tape in two hours and 50 minutes. Not quite the two hours I promised you, but nonetheless, that's two hours faster than the old drive. And the old card might've been in the three hours, but then that would have also been not necessarily the old card. The old card card was good when it was working. The stripe size. The stripe size. Okay, this works. It indeed works. And now I will start the process of backing up chunks of my incoming drive to the little mini hard drives and then getting them to tape and freeing up a drive. I might free up one drive now. I might free up another one later. I might start chipping away at some of my raw dog. That's what I call my raw footage. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this. Tape servers better than ever. Probably gonna get better yet. I'm sure I'll make another video about it at some point. So that said, stay tuned for more because sometimes I like tinkering with tape machines. 
What is this voice doing, sir? Why don't you just end the video like a normal person? <laughs> Goodbye.